when the war between Russia and Ukraine broke out in February uh, this year, I was leading a company that was mostly dealing with COVID-based teleconsultations. We were personally affected by the war on one hand because we had friends and family who got displaced and had to seek refuge in Switzerland and other countries. And at the same time, because part of our development team was based in Ukraine and actually one of our developers um, died in one of the Russian shellings. So we thought about what we could do to contribute and what we could do to help. And we knew that a lot of people were internally displaced and they were sitting in bunkers and didn't have access to any primary care. And we figured that this is something that we can actually help with. Uh, so what we did is we built a chat bot um, using a chat aggregator essentially that people could interact with in their native language on their native communication channels. It was important to have as little data usage as possible and to make it as easy as possible to interact for people who were, had barely any internet access. And so the way it worked that people would essentially message our bot on Telegram or on WhatsApp, and they would be guided through a self-assessment on how serious their condition is. That chatbot would automatically triage this into three categories, either life-threatening, um, urgent or non-urgent, and then this was the only human, human interaction. We had a coordinator who would then look at those three triaged categories and paste them into a WhatsApp group with uh, around 30 doctors that we had. And that's an example here uh, where we had um, a patient that was described and one of the doctors saying, hey, I'll take it. And the doctor was directly calling them on Telegram or WhatsApp. And we tried to introduce a similar concept for Switzerland with the refugees that uh, were coming to Switzerland because there was a, a lot of, especially a lot of hiccups in the beginning. Um, however, we ran into some issues because the leading telemedical company in Switzerland, um, they're quite infamous, you can Google them, they came up with the brilliant idea of making a paid hotline for refugees coming to Switzerland and it was working, it was really interesting. So essentially the refugee had to ask their host family to Google and call that hotline. And then there were two options. Either they had an inter internal translator who would take over the communication, or the host family was acting as the interpreter for the medical conversation between refugees and the medical hotline. As you can see, this is extremely scalable. You needed at least three to five people for every interaction. You had a language barrier. You had absolutely no traceability and no documentation whatsoever. And then, you know, then you see headlines like this, right? Switzerland, the most innovative country between technological innovation and social acceptance. Sure, this, had, this has its validity, because on one hand, you have scenarios like this. This is from this year in May 2022, where the first surgery using augmented reality on a spine was performed at the Bulgris Hospital. But at the same time, we have headlines like this. And this was one and a half years ago. At the beginning of the pandemic, until, until this day, Physicians were using fax machines and post letters to send information to the Federal Office of Public Health for statistical reasons. But this is not limited to statistical reasons. This is being used every day as well for transmission of patient data. Like to this day, people, doctors send each other letters, doctors send each other faxes. And this is being reflected in an index called the Digital Health Index. And I would like you to look at this list. Switzerland is amongst the four worst digitalized countries in the whole of Europe when it comes to this. And what does this look, look at? This looks at availability of, say, e-prescriptions. So how fast can you get a prescription online from your physician? This looks at accessibility to your own medical data. And question to the audience here, who here has full accessibility and full traceability of the last three to four years of medical examinations that were performed in Switzerland? Hands up, I want to see that. For reference, not a single person held up their hand. 
okay? And like, I want to bring up the example of Estonia, and I think what they did is brilliant, because in 2008, they got hacked, and almost all of their data was leaked, and essentially, um, they thought, how can we solve this problem in a way that is sustainable? And what they did is they, they formed a committee of experts within the government, and they started collaborating with a company that focuses on cryptography. And Estonia brought to market one of the very first, worldwide very first blockchain applications. The digital citizenship in Estonia based on blockchain. Transmi the medical identity in Estonia based on blockchain. And what does this mean? This means that you have real-time access to your medical data. If you have an examination or a visit at the hospital today, you go tomorrow to your GP and you can essentially control whether he's allowed to see the data or not. And the question is, why is that, right? And the interesting fact, and I'm going to say a statistic, I promise the only one, 50% of primary care practitioners in Switzerland, that's a statistic from around two years ago, are 50 years, 55 years or older. This means that within the next 15 years, 50% of primary care practitioners will go into retirement. And this is directly reflected in the digital, digital literacy of people. And I want to show you a quote by a guy called uh, Sang Yul Kim. He is an expert in e-health and he was commissioned to help the government transform into the new age, essentially. Um, so that was in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, he came in and he was supposed to come up. He was one of the guys who made the COVID app. I'm sure all of you have the COVID app here, right? Yeah. So he worked on that. And great job, by the way. I think that's probably one of the few apps that I think they did a pretty decent job on. Um, but there's this one quote that I really like by him. And he said, quote, better digitization does not lead to a return on investment. And every hospital in Switzerland is a business. And I 100% agree with this statement. And this is where I circle back to the title of this TED talk and why two letters make a difference. Because digitization just means that we are converting from analog to digital. We're taking paper and we're putting it on a computer. And all this does is creating a double mess from the and from the paperwork, you have the same chaos later on the computer. What we need in order to actually get the return on investment that Mr. Kim was talking about is digitalization. And digitalization deals with processes. And when I started working at uh, my startup, my co-founder, Jayla, she used to work in uh, oil and gas, and she was dealing with digital transformations. And she told me it's really interesting how similar those industries are in terms that it all comes down to digital thinking. And what does that mean? That means you don't take, if you have 17 steps to achieve something, you don't make every one of those 17 steps digital, but you try to find a technology that takes you from A to B in order to make it as efficient as possible and uh, to automate as many things as possible. Okay? And I would like to lead with continue with one example. In whole world essentially, but in Switzerland it's quite prominent, the way it works with documenting medical data is that a physician has the mandate to document data. So he has to write a report documenting the findings of every patient. And I know this looks a bit confusing, let me lead you through that. Back in the 80s, maybe a bit longer, Doctors used to type this up themselves, right? And then they figured, hey, we can actually dictate that and give it to our secretary or to an assistant. And so they used to write that up. And what happened is that these days, instead of using a dictaphone, they often use an iPhone or they use um, some a similar software to dictate that. But the process has remained largely the same, except for some except, uh, ex expectate, uh, you know what I mean. Essentially, <laughs> you dictate, you send it to your assistant, types it up, sends it back to you, you annotate, you correct, you print it, send it out, or fax it, right? And in 2015 or 2016, I'm not sure which year it was, 
I tried to tackle this problem. I was actually in St. Gallen back then at the Start Summit pitch competition, and we came up with a brilliant idea to create apps, like 20, 2015, 2016, that was all about apps, right? And we thought, okay, let's simplify this process by creating a mobile app with which a doctor can interact, where you can essentially drag and drop stuff, where you can dictate everything. You'll have a desktop app where everything comes together, and this is gonna have a cloud solution so he can work from everywhere. And before coming here and preparing the speech, I thought, hey, how would I solve this problem today? And I would actually do it completely differently because these days, what changed from six, seven years ago is that we have different tools available. And I think that what would be amazing is to have some sort of natural language processing. So essentially, while performing an examination, a physician should be able to describe what he's doing and some sort of medical Alexa, we can call her Melexa, would be recording this data and filtering what's relevant and putting it into a format that is actually um, useful and actionable. Because what we have these days is that we have in institutions have terabytes of patient data that is not actionable. It's just lying around and you have a chaos of information. And just like you have in personalized, we're, we're going, the trend in medicine is towards personalized medicine, right? You have personalized drugs. You have personalized physiology approaches. And I think that we also need a personalized approach towards interaction with the data. We have to shift from being passive listeners to proactive communicators and make data actionable. And that's why the professors in this audience I implore you, to, if you have not done so yet, to take on digital literacy into your curriculum because that's something that can be taught and you don't need any coding skills to apply most of these things. And dear students, whether you will end up in healthcare or health tech or whether you'll end up in oil and gas or investment banking, have your own little toolkit and make a change. Thank you.